just so um, we know if we're on the same page, at least to begin with. Rogue libido, the phrase, um, the way in which you understand it, does that, would that depend on the period of history that is um, being uh, uh, the context uh, of, of, of the phrase, uh, historical context of the phrase, or is there at least in modern history uh, to your mind, some sort of a common basic definition of what rogue libido means, at least to you? So, can you all hear me? Yeah? Okay, good. I, in the late 50s, the Anglo-Irish novelist Elizabeth Bowen said, nothing changes more than what's considered shocking. And that's absolutely the case for rogue libido. So, Homosexuality is probably one of the best examples in which we've seen a progressive destigmatization and decriminalization. Um, and here, I'm a historian of Britain and Europe, <laughs> in as much as one can be such a thing post Brexit, um, and I'll also kind of draw as an American on some American history. So, the destigmatization of illegitimacy, the destigmatization of homosexuality, all of those things would have been considered prime examples of rogue libido and are no longer, they've been normalized. Sure, thank, thank you. Um, well, I mean, I think, you know, clearly human instincts have a history and they change over time. So even what we think is somehow being elemental uh, actually change through time and culture. So whether it's sexuality, whether it's the definition of uh, sanity or insanity, um, whether it's the definition of childhood and adulthood, these are not naturally given over time. So I think um, a, a phrase like rogue libido is a phrase that you know, sounds like a copywriter thought up somewhere, but certainly the Greeks would have thought very differently about if, if, if it's a term used to describe the urge uh, for a sexual relationship, let's say, the Greeks would have thought about it very differently from, say, the Persians uh, or the Victorians or us today. So I think in that sense, um, absolutely these definitions change over time. Um, the nature of, you know, at what age it's legitimate to have a sexual relationship. This has varied across human history enormously. It's not been set in any way. Um, the kinds of sexual relationship that people have, the kinds of gender, relationships that are considered uh, conventional or not, these have changed over time. So, yeah, I would say that this, this, this has a history to it, which we need to explore. Has he many thoughts? You know, uh, uh, well, I, I absolutely agree with you, because I wasn't even sure what I'm going to say really on that, on that issue. But I, I think the issue, the conventional issue, uh, conventional definition of what a rogue leader would be, also changes with time. Even now, there are certain conventions that, you know, um, Adultery, for instance, it's still, you know, gosh, if somebody has an affair, although people love to gossip and love to hear, I would also like to hear which movie star is having a relationship with. But it is also almost considered a no-no kind of a thing. Um, so, do we, are we still holding on to the Victorian morals? I'm not sure. But, uh, you know, people's gender and sexualities have, have become much clearer, especially with laws being passed, especially in the West. Um, and yet, we do get very concerned sometimes when people do, you know, things which are not exactly considered normal, not considered, you know, falling within the framework of what the society defines is okay right now. And there are still issues like that. Can I just come in here really quickly to say something that's key, which is, yes, we've all agreed that, that the definitions change. It's also the case that they don't change in one direction. In other words, there's no progressive, enlightened kind of movement to eventual declosing. And that it's clear that some stigmas come out of the closet just as others come go back in. And I think we're in actually a moment in world and national politics in which you can easily imagine that to be the case. Um, the next question I was going to ask you, actually, Deborah, would probably, uh, the answer would probably build on what you just started to uh, say a minute ago. But uh, you've written on uh, the idea of shame and privacy in modern Britain through the lens of what constitutes family secrets. Uh, what about what constitutes public scandal? 
what is uh, seen or understood commonly as permissible behavior, sexual behavior, when it comes to famous men and women. How much has that changed um, in at least the last couple of decades to your mind? Yeah, I think one of the really interesting distinctions, because the Victorians, for us, are always a straw man, right? They're the people who figure as the repressed uh, stereotypes that we've all come away from. Um, I think a really crucial point there is to say, basically, that for the Victorians, if I might make a uh, generalization that I think helps understand you know, what we stigmatize and what we don't, for the Victorians, what they prosecuted and persecuted was bad behavior. So bad moral behavior. What the 20th century tended to prosecute actually, or to persecute, were bad, what we would now call genetics, or bad heredity. So people became more ashamed of things that reflected on their heredity, like, say, mental disability. That gets us away from sex. But that's kind of the trajectory of the 20th century, whereas in the 19th century, the thing that families tried to cover up was the daughter who had the adulterous affair. They didn't try to cover up the mentally disabled child. Actually, that they viewed as the sort of, that was God's will. And is there, has there been, very quickly, uh, sort of different standards applied to what is permissible within families and, uh, and, and, and in society and what is considered permissible when it comes to famous men and women? For the Victorians, that would be much closer together than it would be, I think, if you're making, a, again, a gross generalization between the 19th and the 20th century. But what I would say about the distinction between what happens in families and what happens at the social level or the level of societal transformation, so these big destigmatizations that we started with, is that many things that we see, that we can detect as historians, first at the level of the social, so at the level of you know, demonstrations or laws changing, um, are pretty evident first in many cases in families. So just to give a very concrete example, we know that there's a huge amount of talk within families about homosexuality in Britain. There are tons and tons of examples, and this is before decriminalization even becomes a possibility. And I would argue that there's a causal connection. In other words, what people talk about are forced to talk about, not because they're virtuous people, but because a queer son is in their midst. What they're forced to talk about around the dinner table leads them to a kind of moral relativism that anticipates what's going to happen at the social level. Sunil, you have uh, often spoken about, um, at least after the publication of uh, 50 Lives, um, how that there, there's a tendency uh, for us to perhaps simplify the lives of our great men and women. Um, does this extend to, uh, is there perhaps an even greater tendency to um, uh, not delve into their sexual lives, particularly when it comes to Indian history? Is that something that you've noticed? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, my, I think everyone would agree that, that sex, love, human relationships, these are some of the most serious aspects of being human. Um, they're also some of the most complicated aspects of being human. So I think um, being interested in them and wanting to know about those aspects is a perfectly reasonable uh, curiosity to have. Um, and when it comes to figures from our history, um, again, it seems to me perfectly reasonable to want to know about those aspects of the people we're interested in. It's part of their roundedness, it's part of their richness uh, as, as human beings. Um, and, and I think, you know, we've not had much serious attention to these aspects um, for a number of reasons. I mean, one, uh, something that's you know, quite often observed, which I think is true, that the, the tradition of serious biographical writing about figures in Indian history hasn't really developed. Um, there's been a tendency to have simple, uh, sort of emblematic stories about figures from history uh, who either represent all the good qualities that we believe in or the sort of villainous qualities. 
Um, and, and so I think, you know, at that level, there's, there's, of course, the private lives tend to be entirely excluded. Um, but I think even where we have had some more serious uh, historical studies, there's been a tendency to somehow think private life, sex, love, human relationships are not important, which seems to me a completely absurd uh, way of thinking about it. I mean, these are the most important uh, aspects. And, and, you know, very often they do explain very important uh, decisions that people take, very important uh, sort of engagements and, 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 and networks that they become part of. Um, so I think, you know, we, we, there is a, 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 a tendency to, to avoid those. Um, and it seems to me that we need to explore those aspects, but less to judge them and more to understand them, I think, and to understand how both they add to a richer sense of the person as an individual, but also how often they do help to explain particular episodes, moments, decisions, or at least to bring a nuance to understanding um, those episodes and, and, and changes. So, so I think um, you know, we, we need to have a kind of more grown-up attitude uh, to these figures from, from history and, and to acknowledge that they, like ourselves, have complicated, fraught desires and, and, and lives and, and, and ambitions and, and ways in which they're thwarted as well. And all this feeds into how we are as human beings. So I think we need to actually just be more uh, forgiving um, of each other, but also of the figures in history. And through that, actually allow ourselves to understand um, why they made the choices and decisions they did, and why often they were prevented from making the choices and decisions that, they, that would have been something they would have wanted to do. I'm hoping uh, later on in this conversation, we can make a start. Um, uh, uh, delving into the uh, private lives of uh, at least some of the historical figures uh, that are key and central to us. But before that, uh, Asim, this would be a point I'd like to bring you. And you write about you write about uh, cinema, and you write about you uh, you write about stars as well. And um, is there, uh, at least to my mind, it is. Uh, and I know we were talking about this a little bit earlier, and we may not uh, completely agree on this, but um, is there a tendency increasingly to talk um, lesser about the private lives of stars? Um, on the one hand, there's a proliferation of uh, media. There's, uh, you know, you have your Pink Villa and you have your Miss Malini and you have social media. But when I look back at the sort of columns that existed, whether it's Nita's Nata or the kind of uh, columns that Shobha they used to write, the kind of film gossip journalism, gossip used to be pretty much the mainstay of conversations around cinema, for better or worse. Um, that seems to have um, pretty much uh, um, changed in, in, in terms, in, in more in favor of privacy uh, where, uh, the, uh, where stars are concerned. Is that something you would agree with? See, I, I wouldn't altogether agree with you. I would say yes and no. Uh, yes, at the time when, you know, Shobade launched, uh, I think she launched Stardust, right, with Nita's Natter, um, there was a lot of gossip, conjectured, I don't know, necessarily true, you know, rumors, whatever it was. Um, often there would be, like, full paragraphs without the name, without naming any of the actors, actresses, and you had to sort of, you know, read between the lines or something like that. Um, that happens less and less now. We are constantly fed now because of social media, because of the way all our mainstream newspapers now cover the stars on page three. We're constantly fed, fed what the stars are doing, every day where they're going out, what they're wearing. If they step out without their wives, you know, they stepped out with their wives, are they back together, all of those things. You know, we can read a lot more now. Um, Part of the other thing is I, I personally feel that I think um, journalists have become much closer to stars. They were close to stars even in the 60s and 70s. I'm not saying that. Journalists have become much closer to stars. And they're also aware of the fact that if you, you can spend an evening having drinks with a movie star or a dining event, and, and things will be revealed to you. But they all, you know, the, the stars also realize, understand that there's a line there because the journalists will not be, be able to cover any half of 90% of what they have told 
at, at, on, during those sessions because next time there will be no such session at all. I mean, you know, journalists can be stopped from coming from premieres or to parties or something like that, and that is their, you know, that feeds them in any case and sort of is a part of their job also. So people are becoming a little, you know, careful. There are still rumors. There are, there are you know, we, we do hear about uh, actors' sexuality issues that those are often raised. <clears throat> we hear of, about affairs. Um, but they stay rumors. I mean, and, and they're not being published anymore, you know. Um, my friend Rajiv Masan has a, actually a gossip, a gossip column in Open Magazine, but I don't think, I, I don't know if there are any, many more of those kind of gossip columns that exist. Yeah, no, you're, uh, uh, I think we are in agreement. In fact, it's quite ironical that uh, the proliferation of media has actually led to uh, journalists and, and, and media houses needing stars much more yes. than they used to. And there will be, we, we, we ran into Karan yesterday, he was just coming, he said, you know, he was coming back from the HD summit and, you know, he was at the Times of India Literary Festival uh, here yesterday. So the need for stars and their endorsement uh, has become so, so much uh, that you need to sort of, uh, you know, play by their rules and they have become much more uh, also perhaps savvy in how not just uh, that their bargaining power has gone up, but they've also simultaneously perhaps become more savvy in terms of how they control the information that goes out and gets published between them, at least to some extent. You know, you know the other thing is, by the way, I, mean, I, I was just thinking of the example of Raj Kapoor, uh, very, very well-known, respected uh, filmmaker, director, actor. Uh, his relationships with some of his lead actresses were really very well-known. But I think at that point, I don't think he was necessarily trying to hide it also sometimes. It was, it was out there in the open. Um, that I think people are being much more careful now. If, there is, if people are having affairs. I'm not saying people are having affairs. <laughs> but there is the, the people are being much more careful now. They're, they're very well aware that you step out of your house and there'll be a paparazzi right there. To, you know, the, and somehow it'll, it'll reach social media. And, 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 and so people just they watch what they do. But it does beg the question, you, since you mentioned Raj Kapoor, um, the talk of his uh, private life, his, his sort of romantic and sexual affairs, his libido, so to say, um, was as, as big a part of his mythology uh, as his, uh, of course, his talent and his movies and, and you know, his acting and directing abilities. Um, and one would say right up to the 70s, again, when we talk about Amitabh Bachchan, there's, uh, 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 again, the, the myth of Amitabh Bachchan is not complete without at least one or two of his um, uh, very well talked about, very, very, you know, very uh, popular, popularly talked about uh, affairs. Um, and then you look at the next generation, you look at, just for the sake of comparison, you look at an Abhishek Bachchan or you look at a Ranbir Kapoor, and uh, Abhishek Bachchan has had zero scandals, none, none that I know of at least, I mean, other than, you know, a broken engagement or, or, or something of the sort. And then you look at someone like Ranbir Kapoor, he was recently on Coffee with Karan, and he was talking about how he took time off relationships to sort his head out, he's being celibate, and how he's looking for love, and uh, was very particular in sort of debunking uh, the idea that he's a ladies' man. And he came across as such a sharp contrast to what I imagined Raj Kapoor would have been. Uh, and again, I wasn't around, so maybe it is uh, my own nostalgia, my own, the lens of my own nostalgia that's making me look at those figures in a larger-than-life way. Uh, but I, uh, at least one person from the film industry was once interviewing Farah Khan and she said this to me, not that there aren't affairs and there aren't affairs, but she said, you know, film industry after the Khans has become very regular, you know? And I was wondering if that's, that could possibly be true or is just the way we look at the past that we tend to, um, it seems more magnified from our standpoint. I don't know. I can only sit and speculate. Um, I, I wanted to comment on something I mean, I'll, you know, while addressing what I'm you sorry, asked. We're sitting over here to talk about the libidos of great men and women. We are, that is the very definition of the job. We have to speculate. <laughs> you mentioned something earlier about the fact that media needs the stars a lot because of, of the, the kind of coverage the media does. I mean, in India especially, there's so much coverage of the entertainment industry, especially the Hindi film, Bollywood industry. But the stars also need the media. And so the relationship that they have with the, the journalists, for instance, uh, they're able to feed some amount of information. 
which is often enough to be published. You know, who you're vacationing with, what clothes you're wearing, I don't know, what meals you're eating, what, what's your favorite restaurant, it's not gossip. But still, um, it, it's this two-way street where people, they, they just they tend to meet at some point, the stars and the journalists, and, you know, everyone is being careful. Um, in UK, where you both are from, and I live in New York, I mean, there are all these tabloid gossip magazines. I mean, UK, of course, is, you know, all of the, uh, the News Corp magazine I mean, is it, 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 shocking the kind of stuff that's written. And there are lawsuits and things like that. I, I, I actually was at, uh, worked on the editorial side of the National Enquirer for a few years, so I know exactly how those stories are written. Um, in India, we're a lot more careful. Um, or maybe Indian movie stars are just not scandalous enough, I don't know. <laughs> Would you like to? Yeah, I think that there are a couple of things here. I mean, one of them is national variation in terms of libel laws. That's really significant, and obviously that's a big difference between Britain and the US. The second thing, though, that I would say is that I think, say, in the post-war age, um, there was a much more, and here I'm thinking about America, there was a much more unified celebrity culture. So celebrities in politics, in film, they, these are people who mix together, um, who would be seen together at 21, who had actually relationships with each other. There's a much, there's a, it's a smaller circle, and it's a much more cross-pollinated circle, whereas now you have much larger and kind of siloed off sorts of celebrities, I think. But then third to the issue of um, rogue libido. So one of the prerogatives of celebrity in those years was both the ability to actually have the rogue libido, but also to know that it wouldn't be reported, that you could count on a certain amount of discernment from the journalists whom you were meeting at 21, not to tell tales on you out of school. And as that sort of unitary celebrity culture starts to break down, you know, there's both a broader social destigmatization that's happening, but I think also increasingly we don't think about it as the prerogatives of stars. On the other hand, of course, in the US we've just elected a man who says it is the prerogative of famous people, of uh, famous men to grab um, and sexually harass and even sexually assault women um, and that they can get away with it. So I don't, but I don't think that that was actually the commonly understood experience in Hollywood <laughs> before Donald Trump said it. I just wanted to, to say a little bit about um, this question of you know how do we know about the historian know about these things? We've talked about speculation or rumor, and you know one of the great difficulties here is what is the factual basis on which we can actually know. I mean, very often some of the most important moments or relationships in the human life don't leave a trace. Uh, as historians, we have, there's an archive. So we have letters, we have diaries, we have the observations of others, which we draw upon, which helps us to kind of tell the story. And we rely on those um, and in our interpretations of those. Um, I mean, it's, it's interesting. And again, it's, it's a question of, you know, to what extent people actually want to keep those secret or are they actually writing this record for someone to know about it? And, you know, just to give you an example, I mean, I think probably, the first individual in Indian history who we can say, you know, he had something of a rogue libido uh, was the Emperor Ashoka. Now, Ashoka, from what we know about him, was short, quite ugly, he had bad skin. In, in Bollywood, he would be known as a lens breaker. Uh, and yet, in the early part of his life, he had this enormous harem of women. Uh, many women, apparently, in the harem found him repulsive, and he supposedly had them burnt. But he also, we have, at least in some translations, a piece of very high class graffiti that he left in a cave, which says the prince consort, at that time he was not yet the emperor, the prince consort passed through, this is in central India, passed through this cave with his lover, as it were, his, a, a woman whom he then you know, brought into his harem. So, you know, this was very clearly, he wanted to make this public, uh, this bit of graffiti. So, the, the, the traces that are left, um, I think, are also, it's, it's really important to think about that. And today, um, you know, Asim was talking about how there's a kind of comp complicity between the stars and the journalists, and, and they trade in, in information uh, with certain boundaries and so on. But, you know, you also, of course, have the, the, the 
sort of phenomenon of hacking. And in a sense, there are no secrets now. And, and that's, that's really a, a crossing a boundary that, uh, that, that, that you know, is, has been respected, if you like, up to now, but no longer exists for the, certainly the British press and also, I think, in, in, in the US and certainly for some governments. Uh, it's a boundary that doesn't exist anymore. So, um, you know, it's, it's also a question of what's the information that one can get one's hands on uh, from which to tell these stories. Absolutely, we uh, live in the time of WikiLeaks and, and the phone tapping scandal that happened in the UK. Um, so that might well be one of the uh, big paradoxes of our time. Did you want to add something? I was just going to add actually about, about the archives. I think one of the things that historians have come to learn as they've been working on the history of sexuality is how much there is in the archive. In a way, um, I mean, I'm working now on a group of really rogue, uh, world famous in their moment, his, uh, journalists foreign correspondents, Americans in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And one of these journalists kept detailed notes of every encounter, every conversation, every meeting he had with his lover. So he would come back and he would basically write an encounter of what they did, I mean, what they talked about, um, and so on and so forth. And I think part of when you're talking about what can be known, the sort of deference that one feels towards the eminent national figures here, Having myself tried to find out more about the relationship between, actually, as it turns out, the man's, this man's wife and Nehru, it's incredibly difficult. I mean, I have her side of the correspondence, but very, very difficult to access his. Um, uh, Sunil, you were talking earlier about, and I wanted to pick up from that, we were talking about how there hasn't been, unfortunately, too much of a, um, a, a serious culture of biographical writing there in, in, when it comes to, and there seems to be this sort of uh, oversimplification of, into heroes and villains when it comes to historical figures or sort of uh, just looking at them from uh, for, for the moral of the story, so to say, when we are talking about their stories. Um, but two uh, figures in modern history, uh, Gandhi and Nehru, somehow there's been at least some level of scrutiny when it comes to their romantic lives and their views on sex. Um, Part of it could be because Gandhi himself wrote some in his autobiography, and there could be other reasons. But where do you think this, this sort of uh, slightly unusual scrutiny comes from when it comes to these two particular figures? And uh, what about other figures uh, in modern history, um, at least in popular uh, narratives? Uh, figures such as Ambedkar, Bose, Vivekanand, they seem to uh, completely manage to elude this sort of scrutiny. Uh, well, where does this sort of difference come from? And if uh, you could also expand on that a little bit and talk about what their relationship with sex and uh, love uh, says about the sort of uh, morality that they had and their work, of course, and their significance. Mm. No, I think that's a really interesting issue. And I think, you know, in a sense, you could say that the last 200 odd years of our history um, have been a really interesting period of moral experimentalism in many ways. I mean, if you go right back from, let's say, Ramon Roy to, let's say, M.F. Hussein, I mean, very, very different lives, very different worlds. But so many figures you can trace across the last 200 years who have been, in a sense, both men and women, and I, I you know, one should be very important to emphasize that, who, who've been trying to experiment with different ways of domesticity, different ways of relationships with, with uh, 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 other, uh, other people, uh, different kinds of sociability. So, you know, um, if you take, for instance, yeah, Vivekananda, who travels uh, to the US and Europe and is amazed by the equality with which women are treated. And in fact, his, he develops a kind of fan club of women who support him, who pay for him, who pa patronize him, uh, who, 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 who give him patronage. Um, and he, he, he kind of, it, it, it's a very interesting world to explore. Or if you take, um, you know, take, take Tagore, um, who as a young teenager has this kind of passionate uh, attachment to his sister-in-law, Kadambari, who then, uh, you know, when Tagore is married, uh, according to Tagore's father's wishes, his sister-in-law actually kills herself. Um, um, because she's so distraught, it, it would appear. Or, you know, take, take Iqbal, Muhammad Iqbal, uh, you know, very, who, who in many ways is seen as a, as a con, you know, 
the philosopher of, 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 of Muslim nationalism and so forth. But he has this extraordinary relationship with a, a, a kind of a, a very westernized, if you like, um, woman when he's in Europe and in Cambridge, Fazi. Uh, uh, Fezia, sorry, who, who he writes about. Um, or, you know, Jinnah and his marriage to a Parsi woman, Rati. Um, uh, Fule, uh, uh, Jyoti by Fule and his relationship with Savitri, but this kind of totally new model of what a couple are and how they live. Um, and, and, you know, Gandhi is part of that. Nehru, in a sense, is also part of that. Boz with his, uh, you know, the, the woman whom he marries secretly in Vienna, Emily Schenkel. Um, so so it, th there's so many of these examples. I'm Baker with the, the relationship he has with a woman in, in London uh, who is, you know, works in his office as a secretary um, and, and, and so forth. So, so th I think th this idea that there's somehow a model morality which then there are divergences from is completely illusory. I think these people were living in an era when they had to, in a sense, invent morality. Um, invent morality as, as, as Indians, if you like, um, but also as modern Indians. Um, and, and this carries over into their personal relationships. And I think if we don't pay serious attention to that, we actually miss something very, very important about our history. Um, and it's not about, you know, sensationalizing or digging around in their kind of underclothes. Um, <laughs> It's, it's far more interesting and, and, and important than that. And it actually tells us about the difficulties and, and possibilities that we have to think more openly and freely about the kinds of individual opportunities we want our society to have. Can, can I come in? Because sure. they, these people, and I completely agree, they documented really fully what they were doing. And because it was so crucial to their understanding of self, of what politics was, of what personal autonomy and what national autonomy was. And so this is a case where descendants are far more prudish than the people themselves. OK, um, I'm going to uh, simply because uh, we've been saying men and women all along. But uh, let's be perfectly honest. When you read a title such as Predators, Philandra, Genius, Does Runaway Brilliance Automatically Lead to Rogue Libido? Um, all of us first think of great men. Um, and this could be for many different reasons. I mean, I'm not implying all of us are, uh, uh, you know, sexist in, in, in some form or the other. Uh, but uh, I do wonder, and I want uh, all the panelists, perhaps, if they can, to weigh in on this, uh, how gender uh, complicates, would complicate this subject. Uh, what we're talking about genius women, whether we are talking about larger-than-life film stars who are, uh, uh, you know, actresses, female actors, whether we're talking about politicians, activists, um, how would we um, consider this conversation if it was about them, if we were talking about them? Would you like to start with that? Sure. No, I think it's really important to, to not see this purely as a male thing. In fact, I mean, you know, three, three of the women whom I write about in, in my, my new book, um, uh, I think are really remarkable from this point of view um, of, of their kind of private uh, and, and, and love uh, lives, if you like. Um, uh, so Annie Besant uh, is, is, is you know, one of the, 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 these extraordinary figures who she is married uh, young to a kind of very priggish vicar uh, living in, 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 in the English countryside and is kind of driven mad by the sheep, basically runs away uh, and starts to kind of live in the kind of world of London radicalism, uh, falls in love with a socialist free thinker, Charles Bradlaugh, and it transforms her life. Um, she becomes a radical, she's known as Red Annie, and ultimately she comes to India um, and, and you know, then has her, her, her life here. But, but her, 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 cho her, her choice of, of these relationships is very important. It's a way in which she's exercising her agency her freedom to be a woman. And it, of course, draws her a lot of, lot of criticism. I mean, she's basically ostracized, she can't see her children, and yet she does this because she, she comes to believe uh, in the ideas and in the relationships. Um, or take Amrita Shergill, um, who is, you know, I also write about in my book, who, who, who's fighting against social conformities. And she kind of ends, you know, comes to see relationships and unconventional relationships as a way of giving her a certain space of freedom. Now, her choice in men is uh, 
<laughs> arguable, you know, ranging from Malcolm Muggeridge to syphilitic princes. Um, so she's, uh, you know, her, her judgment there one can question. But again, it's a way of, you know, establishing her, her freedom and agency. Or take M.S. Subalakshmi, whom we think of as this demure, uh, conventional woman who, 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 who actually, she, some of her most extraordinary private moments are when she's in love with uh, not the man she's married to, but another actor. Uh, and there are letters that, that, that still exist. Um, but again, she, she you know, uses this as a way of um, both controlling the men in her life to some extent, um, but also advancing her own interests. So I think it's really important to see um, that this is certainly not a male thing, but also that you know, it's a way of getting a space of freedom very often in a very conformist and, and, and uh, you know, straight-laced society often. Deborah, would you like to? I seem, I mean, I, I, you should have a lot to say about this because we, we spoke about Amitabh Bachchan earlier. And again, this is not to speculate what did or did not happen in his life, but uh, there uh, seems to be uh, some amount of difference in the way we will talk about Amitabh Bachchan's life today as a family man, etc., and the way in which we will talk about Rekha's life. Um, you know, we should have had our friend Yasser on the panel who was, a, we were on a panel together because he just wrote a book on Rekha specifically and uh, opens up uh, a lot about uh, her relationship. So everybody go by Yasser Usman's book on Rekha. Um, you know, I find it very interesting. I mean, so Rekha is one example, of course, um, where she was able to chart her own course. You know, in, the, in, in, in Hollywood, in the West, I was thinking of Julia Roberts, for instance. Julia Roberts went through a series of relationships, and you know, the, the marriage that was about to happen, she had become such a big star after Pretty Women. And most of the men she went out with were not, you know, dated, were not that big stars. She made a film called Runaway Bride. She actually, in some ways, was a runaway bride herself, because she was trying to fight this this, this uh, stardom that had been, you know, uh, sort of, uh, you know, she, she'd been given, and, and that made her relationship with men a little complicated until she actually gave up and she married this the guy, and, you know, um, and then they've had kids, et cetera. And then she, she gave up films for a while. And now it's her choice when she wants to act, when she wants to come back. In India, unfortunately, I think the situation is very different. I mean, you know, you, you, you gave Rekha as an example, which is, um, which has been written about and discussed a lot. I remember as a kid, my mother telling me that Nargis's life was saved by Sunil Dutt because Raj Kapoor had ruined her life. My, I remember my mother telling me. But that belief still exists. And unfortunately, what happens is it, it, it's, it's, it's so important for these actresses to get married. And then we talked about it on our panel yesterday. What happens is once they get married and they have a child or something like that, their career is completely over because nobody wants to cast a married actress. It's, it's a rare instance of a married actress really getting work in, 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 uh, in the Hindi film industry especially. Actors can go through divorces and marriages and whatever it is and you know, they can be 50 and, and then it's fine also. So it's, it's a very strange world we live in really. And it, you know, we still hold on to those very old fashioned values as such. Um, you know, women, you know, actresses have had affairs, but... Uh... Yeah, but it's not just values, it also seems to be the way in which public imagination is shaped. Because when we look at Raj Kapoor, we look at Amitabh Bachchan, we look at Dharmendra, we see, uh, we see legends, uh, you know, sort of victorious legends who are, uh, you know, uh, sort of unequivocally celebrated. But the lives of Meena Kumari, uh, again, she was... She lived uh, with a certain degree of freedom, uh, at least from uh, in, in terms of accounts. And you know that that famous line of "Rat gayi, baat gayi," uh, you know, walking through a corridor. But she is a tragic figure. Parveen Babi is a tragic figure. Right. 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 They were always tragic, tragic figures, figure. or they never got married. Like people like Nanda, or people like Asha yeah. Parikh. Yeah. It was always like they never married. I'm, I'm sure there are actors that we know who are not. Salman Khan is not married. Nobody actually says, "Oh, he's not married yet." He's not. I mean, people do, but it's, the, it's not in the same way as they say. But it sort of lends to his charm in a way. You know, he's he's the last bachelor holding out. But you wouldn't say that about you know, uh, uh, an actress. No, we, we live in a very sexist society. It, it, the, 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 the rules of the game are entirely different. For men and women, really, uh, that made the will remain a legend, despite the fact that he actually got married twice, which is technically against the law in India, but it, it's perfectly normally accepted by everybody. Uh, I'm not making any judgment call on that, but it, it, it's a it, it's a true true uh, true thing. 
uh, first of all, I can't even imagine an actress having two husbands um, anywhere in the world, probably. <laughs> but really, it's it's a, it's a, it's the uh, rules of the game are very different for very women very than different. men. Okay, absolutely. Final question, at least from me, and then we can perhaps take a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, Sunil, you spoke uh, quite well about the need for, uh, in, in many scenarios, for us to not exclude private lives of great men and women uh, in, in our consideration of their life stories. And I can think of at least two good reasons. Uh, one that you yourself mentioned, which is uh, when we're looking at the decisions they made or what made them, what, what, what shaped their ideas and thoughts, that's certainly an important aspect of it. And particularly uh, the way in which we understand psychology, the study of psychology, um, there's always been a sort of relationship between uh, 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 you know, s uh, ideas on sex, sexual behavior, and uh, the way in which uh, the relationship that men and women might have with power. And of course, then there, is, uh, there, there might be some men and women for, uh, whose life, in order to understand their life works, uh, their ideas of sex and morality might be very central. So I'm, I'm obviously thinking of people like Salvador Dali or uh, Simone de Beauvoir or, or Sartre, um, uh, you know, or movements such as surrealism or existentialism. Um, but there is a conflict, isn't there, about where to draw the line. And uh, I was just wondering if you had any last thoughts. I was thinking particularly of this incident uh, I think I was speaking, I, I, I might be wrong, so um, forgive me if I am, but I think in, in, when I was interviewing Ranbir, this is not a part of the published interview, but he was talking about how he would have been open to doing a, a Raj Kapoor Nargis love story, uh, but while his grandmother you know, was alive, that wouldn't quite be possible. And uh, this doesn't even go down to values as much as it goes, or hypocrisy as much, as much as it simply goes down to respect. And it's completely understandable at that level. So just wondering, any last thoughts on uh, how that line, or how that boundary is to be negotiated for journalists and historians? Well, I, I mean, I think it's, it, it, it is a, it's a real challenge to every biographer or historian, um, you know, how you write about these sorts of issues, because they are incredibly sensitive and intimate and uh, take you right into the, you know, closest uh, bits of a person's life. Um, and, and so I think um, it, as, 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 a, as a historian or a biographer, you do need to write very carefully and sensitively. And, and again, as, a, as I said, not judgmentally, but trying to bring out what, what it is that helps us to understand that person, uh, rather than you know, dwelling on it just for the sake of it, I think. So um, you know, there's also a case for discretion in these things sometimes, too. I mean, I think that, those are judgments that historians and biographers have to be willing to make. It's not, if you have all the information, it doesn't mean you use all the information. You use what you think is most valuable to give a best and most true sense that you can of that person's life. And sometimes you are discreet. Sometimes you don't say everything. Uh, but that's what, you know, scholarship, journalism, judgment is about. Can you think of any particular example where you might face this quandary? I, ca I can give an example. Well, let me just also say, um, I think the really key point is that if, even if we agree sexuality is a really crucial element to understanding people, which we might well, it's more important for certain people than it is for others. And I would say that the generation that comes of age, the sort of post-Freudian generation, who are trying in the 1930s and 40s to explain two world wars you know, within a very short space of time and the rise of dictatorship and authoritarianism, for those people, private life and remaking private life of which sexuality was absolutely crucial. You cannot understand their prescription for the world. And that's true for Gandhi and Nehru, as well as for all of the figures, I'm, the Americans I'm thinking about, who are very much wrapped up with them. You cannot understand them unless you understand how crucial sexuality is. And to give you an example of discretion about the journalist I was talking about, where I've got you know, essentially the verbatim account of his affairs, you think, there are actually details in that record which are both excruciatingly embarrassing to the descendants and actually unnecessary for understanding. And in that case, you leave those out. Asim, uh, you've just written Shashi Kapoor's biography, and uh, I wonder what you felt comfortable 
including and were there things that you well, I, I, I clearly wrote the book from one perspective. I thought people were forgetting Shashi Kapoor, had forgotten Shashi Kapoor, the, you know, the generation in the 20s and 30s. And I wanted them to understand and appreciate him through his work, specifically. And his work, that's important, because he made some very, very good films. Um, in, in the Hindi film industry, he produced some very good films. He worked with uh, the Merchant Ivory team and some other Western uh, uh, directors and producers. He also made some terrible Bollywood films, by the way, some really bad Bollywood films. I chose not to write about them. Likewise, I was told while I was working on the book that, you know, apparently there were some speculations, rumors about his affairs with affair or affairs or whatever. The man is 78 years old. He's unwell. Um, it's not like I'm writing the book for his children or his grandchildren. But what is the purpose exactly what you said? What is the purpose of, for me to even speculate? First of all, they, nobody's ever going to give me a concrete evidence or proof if he or anybody else has had an affair. You know, nobody's going to tell me all of that. It's not been written anywhere. I mean, I, I did enough research. And I'm not that kind of a journalist. I wanted to celebrate a man, and I think knowing, even if he had an affair, was not, that, that, that knowledge would not at all change the the perspective of Shashi Kapoor, not make people th think about him like I wanted them to think about him. So I, I'm like, it's, it was not worthwhile information to pursue. Fair enough. Um, uh, I imagine it must have taken some amount of restraint not to uh, write those absolutely wonderful stories that you might have heard. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but I uh, respect you for that, I suppose. OK, so I think I, I, I don't think I have time for more questions, but uh, we probably have another 10 minutes before we have to leave the stage. So maybe we can take a couple of questions from the audience, if anybody has questions. Is there a mic? Anywhere? Hello. Very good afternoon. Pragya, with your kind permission, may I add a scientific view to this, if you allow me one minute? Okay. This is Ian Robertson, the head of the neurophysiology uh, psychiatry at Dublin. And he says there is a scientific angle to it, and it's the reward mechanism in the brain. The guys with higher level of genius and runaway brilliance, which leads to the door of rogue libido, is because of a hormone called serotonin and dop dop dopamine, and oxyacetine. And these chemicals uh, have a self-fulfilling prophecy of going to the doorstep of a libido. How it works is people in power, people with genius, people with brilliance, have a higher need for reward mechanisms and those mechanisms are triggered by uh, dopamine. So it's purely scientific and nothing amorous about it. Well, it's also very slippery territory because I don't know what we're exactly justifying with that scientific information. Uh, but uh, any questions for the audience? Um, gentlemen here. You know, we've been talking a little bit about Gandhi, Nehru, and so on. Nehru, by and large, everybody likes except the Edwina thing. Uh, Padmaja and I know and so on are not mentioned or come up and then disappear from most books. Gandhi, very much of an open book. The recent books by Sitapati on Narasimha Rao, he talks about it, but it's not a big deal. It's, it is there, it's important for Narasimha Rao's political evolution, but it's not central. It's important, but not central. So we might have matured in terms of the way we're writing these biographies and histories. Uh, I'd like your reaction to that idea. Well, just very quickly, I mean, it, I think, again, that's a judgment that the biographer or historian has to make, whether it is important or not. If, if in the case of Nasim Rao, the biographer decides it's not, that they have to then kind of justify that through the story they tell. Um, but it's not a question of whether, you know, making it unimportant. I think, I think sometimes it is very important, and then you have to make the decision to write about it in a way that shows why it's important. Um, it shows why it's important to the person you're writing and the history you're trying to tell. So I, I, I don't think um, that in itself shows that we've you know, grown up. I, mean, I think it's, it's when we start to integrate it in a way into the stories we tell um, that we're really starting to be more, if you like, grown up about it. Do we have any other questions? One over there. Karan has Karan. Good afternoon. My name is Veronica Paul. Excuse me, sitting on the bench. Thank you. Uh, 
Does runaway brilliance automatically lead to rogue libido? That was my first question, but I think that gentleman has answered it partly. My second is, would you consider that the term rogue libido is relative? Uh, the reason I ask is that, you know, in the arts and crafts world, the creative uh, brilliance is present. Libido manifested in public might not be considered rogue in the first place. Whereas in a conservative industry such as banking, for example, any kind of libido manifested in public would be considered rogue. So what would your thoughts be? Um, I, I think pretty much everything is relative. Even brilliance is relative. I don't know what, what we're talking about, genius or fame or entitlement. I meant a creative but any thoughts, and intellectual. Yeah, yeah, sure. But any, any thoughts? I think this is at the level where it's impossible to take a consideration of gender out of it. So that, I mean, I'm thinking, for instance, of the American novelist Marilyn Robinson, who I think is a brilliant novelist. The idea that she would, and she's probably a brilliant person, the idea she has a rogue libido, I seriously doubt. So I think, again, rogue libido is oftentimes has been used as a self-justification in order to prove brilliance. And, and this group of journalists I'm studying, you know, the reason why, you, why some of them slept with as many as 115 women, not counting the prostitutes, was as a way of proving to themselves that they were, in fact, brilliant. Uh, the, Karan had a question, and then here in front. No one's giving him a mic. mic. Is there... um, I had a question, sort of looking at this in reverse. Whether, um, and this is for all, all three of you, since you've studied uh, this to a degree, whether the periods, the whether whether rope. Uh, libido actually has an effect on brilliance in a sense, whether um, the periods when some of these actors or writers or intellectuals are acting on their rogue libidos coincide with their most productive periods in their intellectual lives, or actually the periods where they're not acting on them um, and they're actually maybe constrained are the periods where they're being more productive. Because uh, it's obviously hard to make a generalization, but just anecdotally, I was wondering if um, you have seen a connection there. The all-important reverse causality question. Yeah, yeah. Well, very briefly, I mean, I think it varies a lot. I mean, sometimes you find these periods of intense relationships, love, sexual relationships, at moments of depression in someone's life. Um, at other times, it is moments of very heightened activity, travel, um, um, you know, being in different uh, circumstances. And so, so I think it does vary a lot. Um, and I, I don't think that, that there's any kind of you know, natural correlation between uh, heightened moments of political activity and, and relationships. And, and you know, very often these things are just defined by opportunity um, as well. And you know, a lot of the lives, the, uh, the lives of politicians and so on, um, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not that many moments when they're out of the public eye or whatever. So, so I, I think it, it varies from case to case. Well, I was going to actually say something somewhat different. I mean, I, uh, this question about brilliance and rogue libido and things like that. I, I, you know, people have libido, no matter how brilliant you are. You know, people, ordinary people who are not famous, well-known, well-off, cheat, have all sorts of relationships also, as do famous people. And then the opposite happens also. Famous people also, you know, Paul Newman and, and his wife, Joanne Woodward, stayed completely August, I think so, at least. Um, it's, it's really hard to say. There is a certain belief that once, when people become, when they get the sense of power, um, they think they can get away with everything. That infamous Donald Trump tape, which, God forbid, I don't know why, I don't know why he did not lose the election just based on that tape, where he was talking to the MSNBC reporter, where he talked about, like, he could just grab women. But that, that was coming from the power. The man has so much wealth that he just doesn't give a damn about it. And it is true. Everybody around him kept laughing. Oh, the Donald can do this. The Donald can do this. Because he has so much wealth, therefore he could do this. He thinks he could. And he, he was able to do it also. Uh, so there is, you know, it, it does happen. It is, it is upsetting as hell that these kind of things can happen when people use, misuse their power to that extent. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think the big danger is reading one somehow as a stand-in for the other. And since libido is much more common than brilliance, right? That reading this kind of hyperactive libido somehow as being a sign of of a, of an exceptional person. Okay, one last question, uh, lady here. Thank you. Uh, I was just uh, listening, and then I saw how uh, we kept saying affairs, you know, and uh, affairs is like. Uh, uh, something very hush hush and um, behind closed doors and uh, and uh, scandalous and then today today the word is uh, uh, just now Mr. Chavra used it just now for the first time he said relationship today people say you know somebody is in a relationship with somebody else and that kind of seems to make it more more acceptable and more um, I don't know it's just a thought that came to me when I kept hearing everybody use the word affairs whereas now people say relationship that so and so is in a relationship with somebody and so just a thought. Okay, is there a question? We can probably take one over here, please. Uh, we are talking about rogue as well as libido. Uh, most dangerous so-called sexual crimes happen in war-like situations, which unfortunately no so-called sane or logical journalist is allowed to get into. Iraq reports something dangerous and they are all powerful. There was one army general in US who was running with one journalist and he had an affair. That story has come up out of US. But I don't know how many Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan, Syria, so many murders, so many, nothing about war and worse women are the most hit in this so called wild violence what I call. Any Sorry. thoughts or can somebody study that? We, we are having easy, cozy time, you know. Ah, let's follow Nehru, let's follow Amitabh Bachchan. Good dear, it's not risky to my life and still uh, it well, is. Well, uh, partly, sir, your, I take your point, but the, the topic of conversation was about brilliance and genius and rogue libido, so, not so much about... Uh, no, in war uh, also, fair amount of genius. Hitler was another character in his as well. All wars are predominantly... Sure, fair enough. I mean, you, there can be many different ways of moderating this panel. This was one, but any thoughts on... on, on a little bit, you're, you're right about that. I mean, during wars, for instance, I mean, what happened uh, in Kosovo and in Rwanda, uh, many soldiers and many generals, and it, this is over, even in history, you can go back to, you know, centuries, really, when they have a sense of power. I mean, one way they think that they can actually express a sense of power is by raping women, you know. Um, it, it's, uh, the power does bring that sort of, it, it sort of derails a person's mind. And I would say, I would add to that just to say that, you know, an expansion area in terms of how people have considered human rights and the scholarship on human rights in the last 20 years especially has been to think about you know, wartime rape as an issue, not just of some sort of sexuality, but really of violence and of vi that, a very particular kind of violence that is ex extremely effective at demoralizing um, the civilian population and the fighting forces. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for talking to us and thank you for listening to us. Thanks.